Okay, let's solve the 2021. Uh, question number one regarding the suppression of the intraocular inflammation. Corticosteroids act by inhibiting which one of the following enzymes? Number A, cyclooxygenase. This is easy one. The answer will be D. This is uh, uh, written frankly, and this is a pharmacology uh, question, and the answer is phospholipase A2. Foscarnet in comparison to gan gancyclovir. Here, phoscarnet is preferable to gancyclovir um, during to wider safety profile due to uh, uh, minimal uh, myelosuppression because the uh, plastic anemia uh, caused by gancyclovir may be avoided by using phoscarnet. So phoscarnet is, uh, isn't that, uh, actually isn't that potent, but actually uh, here it is more safe. So uh, the answer here is number C, it causes minimal myelosuppression or minimal aplastic anemia. Question number three, the interval, uh, or sorry, the intravitreal injection of antibiotics generally maintain uh, a, bacteri a bactericide uh, concentration of antibiotic. Here, the period should be uh, within 24 hours. Here, the, the, the most correct one is um, uh, 24 to you know, 48 hours. And actually, you can uh, expand or you can extend this period from 24 to uh, 48 hours for some bacteria. So number uh, B, uh, is the good answer for um, any antibiotic to act as bactericidal or to work with bactericidal effect. Number four, when comparing ICG and fluorescein, which one? ICG better identifies CNV, classic CNV. Actually, uh, ICG better identifies, uh, identifies uh, some uh, non-classic forms like polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. But here for classic CNV, it can be easily identified also by fluorescein angiography. Number B, ICG uh, is more protein bound in the bloodstream. Uh, uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, ICG is more um, protein bound in the bloodstream. Uh, that's why it, ha it has uh, short, uh, longer duration uh, and fluorescein has shorter duration. Number C, neither ICG nor fluorescein uh, is an iodine based. No, uh, ICG is iodine based. Fluorescein is not. Number D, peak fluorescence of fluorescein is at longer wavelengths. No, peak fluorescence of uh, ICG is at longer. I, actually, ICG is at, um, the fluorescence is at uh, 835 uh, nanometer. And for fluorescein, it is at um, uh, 555, which is for the green. Here is it is infrared, infrared spectrum, and here green spectrum. So uh, the last one is false. Here the answer is, um, uh, the correct answer is B. Okay, uh, regarding question number seven, a 33-year-old uh, man uh, has high myopia history of bilateral RD, cleft palate, and epiphyseal dysplasia. Uh, actually, here, this one, which is cleft palate, um, epiphyseal dysplasia, this is um, one of the, um, something called Pierre Robin, um, uh, Pierre Robin uh, sequence, which is, uh, uh, present with both Stickler syndrome and Wagner syndrome. But which one here? In order to differentiate between them, I'll pick uh, or I'll see high myopia. High myopia is uh, consistent more with Stickler syndrome. If this myopia uh, is um, low myopia or moderate myopia, I'll pick Wagner syndrome. So here the answer is Stickler syndrome. Okay, both of them will have uh, uh, myopia, but this myopia is not progressive. So it is not degenerative myopia or progressive myopia, just high myopia. Okay, so the answer here is C, Stickler syndrome. Number eight, regarding progressive intracellular storage of uh, sphingomyelin and cholesterol, this is nine men, uh, this is nine men, sorry, pick syndrome, nine men pick syndrome. Okay. Um, number nine, the answer is AV malformation. Actually, look at look at this uh, abnormality. Uh, this is consistent with uh, arterial venous malformation. So this will be uh, uh, this will be associated with number C, retinal arterial venous malformation. Um, and for retinal arterial venous uh, malformation, it is called racemos. And it is a spectrum of a, a disease which is called Weiborn Mason, which is a pigmatosis one, Weiborn Mason uh, disease or syndrome. Uh, question number 10 regarding type 1, sorry, type 2 diabetes. Which one? Number A, 
at the time of diagnosis, retinopathy is less likely than with type 1? No. At the time of presentation, we find that 5% of cases will have retinopathy. Okay, so uh, here screening uh, for diabetic retinopathy with type 2 is immediate, but in type 1, it can be delayed up to five years. Number B, it can uh, usually be controlled by diet. Yes, this, this can, can be done. It can usually be controlled by diet uh, because there is no um, uh, decreased level of insulin. Actually, the insulin level is normal, but the uh, insulin uh, tolerance or insulin intolerance uh, will be the cause. Okay, number C, uh, the con uh, concordance between identical twins is nearly absolute no. Here, concordance, which, which means that if some sibling um, or some twin uh, um, has the disease, the other uh, will have, okay? And this is not 100% uh, present. So the concordance here is not absolute or nearly absolute, okay? So number C is false. Number D, the insulin levels of affected individuals are severely reduced. No, this is for type one, not type two. So the answer here, the most correct one is B, can usually be controlled by diet. Number 13, regarding the treatment of vitamin A deficiency, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Corneal healing improves almost immediately when vitamin A uh, supplement are started. No, uh, actually corneal healing will persist even after good treatment. And uh, the likelihood for, um, uh, for, for having keratoplasty is high and Actually, here the problem is uh, for for hypovitaminosis A or uh, vitamin A deficiency won't be that corneal. Uh, the patient will be susceptible to premature, premature, not blindness, premature, also premature death. So number A is false. Number B, intramuscular injection of other miscible vitamin A can be used when malabsorption is likely. Actually, here this is not false, but look at here water miscible. Uh, I looked for this and found that uh, there is some preparations of vitamin A are water miscible. You know that vitamin A uh, is uh, uh, mixed with fat, not uh, mixed with water. But there is a preparation which is present commercially for water miscible vitamin A. So this can be used in cases of malabsorption or uh, uh, malabsorption syndrome. So number B is true. Number C, oral vitamin A is required daily for at least 10 days in severe deficiency uh, this is um, this is not false but here at least uh, 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 10 days we are uh, prescribing this for two months or even three months if the patient has manifestations of um, uh, severe deficiency of vitamin a so number c is not that accurate number d vitamin a supplements are required every four weeks for children in endemic areas no uh, for four to six months, four to six months uh, uh, if, the, if the child is present in an endemic area. Okay, so here for me, the answer will be number B. This will be more consistent. Actually, uh, I, um, um, I recommend that it is B, but it may be C. For me, I'll, I'll pick it as B, water miscible, because this, I, I found that this is commercially available, okay? Uh, number 14, regarding ocular tuberculosis, which one? Choroidal tubercles don't respond to systemic treatment. No, actually, chor choroidal tubercles may disappear with just the anti-TB without the need for corticosteroids. So number A is false. Number B, drug therapy is free of side effects. No, we have uh, like isoniazid and ethambutol. We have even uh, optic neuropathy. So number B is false. Number C, it always uh, occurs secondary to pulmonary tuberculosis. No, always, always wrong. Number D, it can present as flectinular conjunctivitis. Yes, it can present as flectinular conjunctivitis, but this is not, uh, this won't be considered ocular tuberculosis, will be considered um, a reflection from a tuberculosis other, uh, or, or, or anywhere in other side, like pulmonary uh, TB and so on. But here it can present as uh, uh, flectinular conjunctivitis. This will be the most consistent one. So number D is the answer. Uh, which is delayed, actually delayed hypersensitivity reaction in the conjunctiva um, at um, the shape or or uh, with the shape of nodule or nodular appearance, grayish nodule with a zone of hypremia like that. Okay, number 15 regarding the development of metastatic disease from uveal melanoma. 
which one of the following here, the, uh, this is uh, easy and crank it is the liver. Okay, number 16, which one following infection or infectious retinopathies is most likely to have the best prognosis? Actually here, look at this arm. Uh, this is the only one to be just peripheral. Arm acute retinal necrosis is peripheral on or starting in the peripheral retina, not in the center. Candida can start on the center and actually candida albicans Retinitis indicates that this patient has uh, fungemia. This patient has fungus uh, in his blood. So it is a form of endogenous, not exogenous, endogenous endophthalmitis or endogenous uveitis. So uh, here number B is false. Uh, the prognosis is uh, poor. Um, uh, either the prognosis for um, uh, life or the prognosis for uh, the general condition or the prognosis for vision. So number B is false. Number C, cytomegalovirus retinitis. No, uh, uh, it results in fall thickness necrosis of the retina and actually it can uh, affect the central portion uh, with severe vision loss. Number C is false. Number D, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. This can result in this actually in uh, children who are suffering from this one, which is uh, a demyelinating disease. So, number um, A, acute retinal necrosis will be the best one. Number 17. Uh, a 30 years old or a 30 year old woman with ulcerative colitis and iatrogenic Cushing syndrome is receiving intravenous uh, hyperalimentation after uh, undergoing a colectomy. Uh, her right eye becomes red and she has pain and floaters in that eye. Which one of the following is uh, the most likely diagnosis? Actually here, because she, she is uh, at risk for having infection in this one, infection in this uh, intravenous uh, uh, line. Actually, this intravenous line, which is hyperalimentation, which is used for, um, uh, used for feeding uh, because she, she doesn't have colon right now, um, uh, this intravenous line will be more liable to infection. So here it will be mycotic endophthalmitis or fungal endophthalmitis. This would be uh, the good one, or this will be the answer. Here, uh, she has pain and floaters. These are also, um, uh, this can present with any form of uveitis. So here, she has mycotic uveitis or mycotic endophthalmitis, which is endogenous one. Actually, this uh, can occur with uh, um, uh, drug abuse and something like that, but here, uh, it, it is another thing, which is hyperalimentation intravenous, which is very porous or very wide, uh, line, uh, which is more liable to infection. Number 18, in uh, preparing a patient with ruptured dope of, for surgical repair, which one of the following uh, anesthetic options is uh, most appropriate? General with pancoronium uh, or general with succinylcholine? Actually, it is general. It must be general anesthesia. Okay, but general with uh, pancoronium or general with succinylcholine? Succinylcholine is contraindicated here. Why contraindicated? Because it can result in increased IOP. This will result in uh, extrusion or this will result in uh, loss of the, 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 the eye tissues. The eye tissues will be uh, extruded away from the eye because there is a ruptured group. So here general with pancoronium will be the answer, number eight. Question number 19, uh, the gene that causes Nuri disease is uh, in which one of the following chromosomes? Nuri will be present in X chromosome X because it is X-linked recessive disease, X-linked recessive disease. Okay, number 20, which one of the following conditions is the most important contraindication to elective surgery? Uh, chronic angina or myocardial infarction within six months, newly diagnosed AF or right bundle branch block. Actually, I saw people with chronic angina on table, on elective surgeries and also uh, people with old myocardial infarction and also bundle branch block. So number C, which is the only acute one, newly diagnosed if uh, uh, this, the, the, the elective operation can be postponed. So number C, uh, it is a contraindication to elective eye surgery. It, if it is, uh, if it is uh, emergent, uh, the patient can have the operation, but if not, the patient won't have to, um, uh, won't have to be uh, rushing for uh, the operation. Okay, so number uh, 20, the answer is C. Uh, 21, regarding uh, the global burden of visual loss, 
which one of the following is most likely to be true? According to WHO, visual loss accounts for 10%. No. According number B, the leading cause of moderate to severe visual impairment is in order or uh, macular degeneration, uncorrected refractive errors, cataract? No. The order will be for visual impairment, the most uh, probable and the most um, uh, uh, the most important uh, or the most common cause is refractive errors, uncorrected refractive errors. After that, cataract and after that, AMD, age-related macular degeneration. But look at number C, the major causes of blindness are in order cataract. Yes, cataract is uh, the most cause of reversible blindness. After that, uncorrected refractive errors. Yes, I agree. And after this is macular degeneration. So the answer here is C. This is according to the WHO. Number D, the number numbers uh, of, uh, are approximately 50 million blind and 100 million with the, uh, moderate to severe visual impairment. The numbers are more than this one. So here, the answer will be, frankly, it will be number C. Okay. Uh, number 24, regarding the global burden of uncorrected refractive error. Which one of the following is most likely to be true? Age standardized rates of disability as measured by DALI are uh, increasing. Actually, this is not false, but here uh, number B, it accounts for 7 million uh, cases of blindness. Actually, this number was uh, for refractive errors. Actually, uh, this number was uh, present uh, like 6.8 million in uh, uh, 20. Uh, 10 and 7.4 millions in 2015. So here, this will be um, this will be uh, uh, um, a good answer because it is about 7 millions. Actually, it is not a strict uh, a strict number. So number B is true. Uh, regarding uh, number A, what do you mean by daily? Daily means disability adjusted life years. What do you mean by this? Uh, actually, uh, here uh, if the patient is having a um, disabling disease. And this disabling disease can kill the patient, actually. Um, if the patient dies or the patient lives with disability, this is considered like um, for, for just for, for uh, 20 years uh, with disability. Um, and this is considered uh, daily, sorry, uh, disability adjusted uh, life years. If the patient dies before his life expectancy. Also, the years that he dies before his life expectancy um, uh, is considered also um, or can be considered also disability adjusted life years. Uh, the difference between Dali and Kali, which is quality adjusted life years, quality adjusted life years means that uh, the, the, the patient that he um, uh, is living or the years that the patient is living with good health. So um, here the answer will be B, accounts for 7 million cases of blindness. Number C, it is more of um, a burden in terms of disability in middle income countries than in low income countries. No, low than uh, uh, low income countries, it will be more uh, than in, in middle. It is now the leading cause of global blindness. No, the leading cause for global, uh, global visual impairment, not global blindness. So number, um, Number B is the true answer. I have no objection, by the way, on number A. For me, I'll, I'll pick number B because it is written, frankly, um, in more than one, one website. Okay, number 25, when planning a public health program for diabetic retinopathy, which one of the following statements is most likely to be true? All children under um, 10 years old with diabetes should have the retinas examined every year. Actually, here this is uh, uh, not true because in, in type 1 diabetes means you, you, you can wait up to five years uh, for the first screening, okay? Up to five years from the diagnosis. Number B, diabetes is uh, only found in rich people who live in cities. No, this is false. Number C, laser treatment should be available for everyone who needs it. Yes. If I, if I want to, to have a good public health program for diabetic retinopathy, laser treatment should be available. Number D, uh, only ophthalmologists and optometrists can detect uh, diabetic retinopathy. No, we can uh, also depend on neurologists who can use um, the ophthalmoscope and they can also uh, see the diabetic changes. So number C is the good one. Okay. Number 26, regarding trachoma, 
elimination strategy. It is actually the safest strategy of uh, the WHO and S for surgery, surgery for trichesis, and trachoma, and A for um, uh, antibiotics, which is azithromycin, by the way, and F for facial hygiene, E for uh, environmental uh, improvement, and this is frankly number uh, number C, surgery, antibiotics, facial cleaning, and uh, environmental improvement. So the answer here is C. 27, uh, regarding WHO criteria for visual acuities, which one of the following uh, levels of acuities most likely to be defined as severe visual impairment? Actually, it is below 660, not even 660, but here the answer, the, the most correct one is, uh, is number D. Moderate will be from 618 up to 660. And below 660 is considered severe uh, visual impairment. So here, number D is um, uh, the good one. Regarding this question, here um, I'm looking at a brown lesion here. Uh, I know that this is not colored one, but brown lesion will raise my suspicion uh, to um, two issues, actually, malignant melanoma and uh, uh, OSSN, ocular surface squamous neoplasia. And here uh, we will uh, depend on this specimen. Unfortunately, we can depend on this specimen in order to differentiate between them. Um, uh, actually, I don't see any colors here because here the, um, uh, this is a photograph, but here, if there is a brown discoloration, which is invasion with, with melanin or melanocytes, this can raise the suspicion for having uh, choroidal, uh, sorry, uh, conjunctival melanoma. But uh, actually here, uh, I'll go more with OSSN, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, and if so, I'll pick number A. It is likely that she has xeroderma pigmentosa. Uh, actually, neither of them. Radiotherapy to the surrounding area is necessary. No, recurrence is unlikely after excision. No recurrence can be can occur. Actually, number D. The uh, uh, the lesion is a malignant melanoma. Uh, no, the lesion is ocular surface squamous neoplasia, and this will be more evident when we see uh, the colored one. Okay, but here uh, for me, uh, without seeing the colored one. I'll go with uh, having ocular surface comastoplasia rather than conjunctival or ocular surface uh, malignant melanoma. So number 31, regarding malignant melanoma, biopsy shows infiltration predominantly by macrophages. Yes, uh, this can occur. Biopsy soon after, onset shows infiltration predominantly by lymphocytes. No, this is not soon after. This, this can occur later. So lymphocytes can occur can the infiltration can occur later with lymphocytes. So number B is not false, but it is not accurate as well. Number C, fibrosis is an early feature in some cases, no. Number D, pain is a frequent feature, no. Here pain is uh, almost absent. So the answer here will be A, biopsy shows infiltration with macrophages. Um, regarding the prognosis of malignant melanoma patient with chromosome six aberration, Actually, if there is chromosome three, not six deletion, uh, the prognosis will be poor. Spindle cell tumor carry the worst prognosis? No. Spindle cell tumors uh, will carry the best one, the best pro uh, prognosis. Prognosis is worse in younger patients? No. Prognosis is worse in older patients. A number D tumor involving the ciliary body carry a worse prognosis? Yes. Uh, if there is ciliary body affection, the prognosis will be poor because it, is, uh, uh, it, it will be discovered lately. Here, look at this photo, this specimen. I told you before that uh, I, show, uh, I showed you this uh, specimen before, and this is a case of herpes simplex virus keratitis. Uh, how, how do I know? I see something like intranuclear inclusions. Here, these are intraocular inclusion bodies, okay? For intraocular inclusions, and here he, he mentioned that it is a corneal biopsy. And uh, uh, within the corneal biopsy, I see intranuclear <clears throat> inclusions. So this is more consistent with herpes simplex virus. Okay. Uh, also, the intra um, uh, nuclear inclusions may be with cytomegalovirus retinitis, but or cytomegalovirus actually. Um, um, but cytomegalovirus uh, will have this appearance, which is uh, uh, all eye appearance, all. All's eye appearance. This is more consistent with the cytomegalovirus. So um, this is herpes simplex. 
corneal epithelial cells are the first to get infected? Yes, this is absolutely true. Number B, corneal involvement is common in primary infection? No. Number C, there is a little likelihood of secondary glaucoma occurring? No, there is a high likelihood. Here, the intraocular pressure uh, will be high due to the herpetic uveitis. Number D, uh, the virus is not uh, amenable to diagnosis by PCR? No, this is false. This is a DNA virus which can be diagnosed. Okay, so the answer here, uh, in order to be brief, the answer here is A, corneal epithelial cells um, are the first to be infected, and this is a herpes simplex virus one. VHL von Hippelin though, which one? Angiomas near the optic disc are easier to recognize than peripheral ones? No, actually the angiomas will be orange in color, so it can be missed if it is at the optic disc or behind the optic disc, something like that. Okay, so number A is false. Number B, cavernous angioma develop in either the retina or the optic disc. No, it is not cavernous, actually. It is capillary hemangioma, capillary, not cavernous hemangioma. Multiple angiomas may be found in the same eye. Yes, multiple angiomas may be found in the same eye. This is written, frankly, in American Academy. Number D, unilateral involvement occurs in 80% of cases of, of patients, no, actually, um, uh, here uh, it is mostly bilateral, not unilateral. So, number um, C, multiple angiomas may be found in the same arm. Yes. Number 35, which one of the following procedures has been proven to reduce the rate of endothelmitis after cataract surgery? It is the intracameral injection of uh, cefuroxime. And this one was repeated from the previous clinical ICO exams and uh, answered like that in the answer sheet. So the, the answer here is A. This is an easy one. An exoditive RD is most uh, commonly seen with which one of the following hemangiomas? Um, exoditive retinal detachment with, with retinal capillary hemangioma because it is exoditive actually. Here uh, for retinal capillary hemangioma, this will result in, in, uh, in, in leakage. Unlike what? Unlike the response, which doesn't leak, and the evidence is fluorescein angiography. And also in cavernous hemangioma, not capillary, cavernous one. Cavernous hemangioma won't leak because it is it will be very slow. The leakage will be very slow, uh, uh, actually. Uh, and this also will be more evident with the fundus fluorescein angiography. So here, the retinal capillary hemangioma will be associated more with the exoditive retinal detachment. And this occurs, as we mentioned, in von hippel uh, syndrome. Okay, number 41, neuroophthalmology. Um, here, the neuro, um, neuro questions are um, somehow tough. Okay, which one? Neuro question regarding this exam, not uh, all the exams, but regarding this exam is somehow tough. Uh, which one of the following pacomatosis is most likely to be inherited as autosomal recessive? This uh, one is easy, ataxia telangiectasia, or um, it is called uh, lewis Barr syndrome, ataxia telangiectasia, or lewis Barr syndrome. So number E. Uh, in tuberous sclerosis, it may be uh, actually sporadic. And uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 and von hippelin do are autosomal dominant, both of them autosomal dominant. Neurofibromatosis type 2 is carried on chromosome 22, the long R, and von hippelin do is carried on the third chromosome. Uh, number 42, uh, an infant with bilateral uh, fundus finding uh, shown in this figure. Uh, is uh, also most likely to have which one of the following non-ocular abnormalities. Here, a genesis of the uh, corpus callosum, actually this is associated with morning glory syndrome, and here this, not, this is not a case of morning, morning glory syndrome. Uh, neuroblastoma, no. Uh, patent ductus arteriosus, this is not associated with uh, optic disc anomalies. So number D, renal insufficiency, this may be true, because this may be Icardi syndrome or Icardi disease. Uh, what do you mean here by Icardi or what, what is the, the lesion that we can see? I can see that there is colobomitous optic disc and I can see also some uh, coloboma in, uh, 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 elsewhere in the retina. So it's combined coloboma of the optic disc and uh, coloboma uh, elsewhere. And here for uh, Icardi uh, disease, it can result in coloboma, it can, can result in hypoplasia. So, here, the answer will be renal insufficiency, which is associating Icardi disease. Number 43, a 42-year-old man is referred with sudden onset leptosis and Berwi. Here, this is a characteristic of direct 
direct EV fistula, direct carotid cavernous fistula. So number B is the true one, carotid cavernous fistula, uh, because of the presence of Berwe, not only uh, just ptosis, uh, ptosis and Berwe. Number 44, uh, which one of the following is a recognized side effect of Botox, botulinum toxin, injected into the orbicular zucchini muscle? Anisocoria cycloplasia dry eye or introcan actually dry eye due to exposure because here I'm paralyzing or temporarily par paralyzing the orbicular zucchini muscle, which will result in eyelid closure. So here the patient may suffer from uh, some degree of lag of thalmus, and this lag of thalmus will increase the evaporation time. So and this will result in dry eye. Look at this uh, one, which is homonymous manokia, uh, um, which is left homonymous manokia to be accurate. Here the patient um, referred from the glaucoma service with this visual field, okay? Uh, he, uh, his wife is um, telling that he is becoming more forgetful, okay? And this will indicate that uh, this patient may have a problem in the cerebral cortex or the visual cortex or uh, the parietal loop, more forgetful, okay? Uh, which one of the following uh, tests would help to confirm the most likely cause of this visual field effect was based on the history. Here he's um, telling us that the word forgetful is important. So either it is um, um, uh, visual cortex or a parietal loop lesion. Here for Number E, optokinetic nystagmus assessment, this will be the good one. Because here for, for optokinetic nystagmus assessment, the patient will have um, uh, loss in the optokinetic nystagmus at the same direction, okay, of the lesion. Here the lesion will be in the right loop, okay? So when we are rotating this uh, to the right side, uh, um, consider or, or, or consider yourself as being the patient and rotate this to the right, um, you won't have any nystagmus. But if you rotate it to the left like that, the nystagmus will be uh, present. So number uh, A is um, number A is uh, um, um, true one. Pupil assessment, this, will, this won't be that relevant actually. Uh, the patient may, may show, by the way, it may show or he may show some uh, small or mild, very mild relative apparent period effect, but this won't be the, the most important test to confirm the diagnosis based on the history, which is forgetful. This will be uh, optokinetic nystagmus drum. Okay, visual evoke potential and simultaneous finger counting across the midline law. Okay, so number 52, a 32 year old woman presents with a horizontal jerk nystagmus, which beats to the left and increases in magnitude on looking to the left, uh, which is uh, the most consistent uh, diagnosis with uh, her finding above. Actually, here she has something called gaze evoked, gaze evoked nystagmus. For gaze evoked nystagmus, you have to affect the cerebellum or the brainstem with either demyelination or uh, ischemia uh, or uh, even tumor, but here, uh, the most uh, likely one regarding her uh, sex and regarding her age will be multiple sclerosis, will be the demyelinating one, okay? Um, for acoustic neuromatis, um, somehow not related to the um, cerebellum or the brainstem, for Carey or Arnold Carey malformation, it will be uh, more consistent with uh, downbeat nystagmus, not uh, horizontal one. Infantile isotropia, um, uh, won't be like that. Infantile isotropia will, will result in a disease called fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome, which has another name, which is called latent manifest nystagmus, latent manifest. How, or, or manifest latent? It is manifest actually but, uh, as being mild, but when we cover one eye, it will be, um, it will be more severe. So it, is, it, it has some latency. Um, it, it is not that manifest, okay? So it is called manifest latent or fusion and development nystagmus syndrome. This, this will be consistent more with the infantile isotropia. And actually the direction of this will be towards the fixating eye. So when I cover this eye, for example, this eye is covered, this eye will be aligned like that. And uh, um, the direction of the first phase will be here towards uh, the left of the patient, something like that.
okay? The left eye is fixating, so the direction of strabismus, or sorry, the direction of nystagmus will be to the left. So uh, the answer here is um, number, uh, number D, multiple sclerosis. Uh, question number 53, a superior oblique palsy on one eye and Horner syndrome uh, in the other eye could be due to a single lesion in the midbrain. And this one was repeated uh, from the, the previous clinical ISO exams. And I think we, we all know the, the explanation because here in the midbrain, here we do have the, um, uh, this is uh, the, the, the fourth nerve center. And here we do have the sympathetic, which is uh, in relation to the hypothalamus, which is in a close proximity to the midbrain. Here, look at a lesion here, um, a lesion here affecting the sympathetic and affecting the fourth nerve nucleus. We, we all know that the fourth nerve nucleus will decussate or the fibers will decussate like that in order to supply uh, the superior oblique muscle of the other side. So here, Horner. Uh, in, in this side and superior oblique pulse in the other side will be more likely in the midbrain. Okay, so number B is true. Number uh, 54, regarding pituitary apoplexy, which one of the following is most likely to be true? IV hydrocortisone should be given as soon as the diagnosis is made. Yes, because it is a uh, life-threatening condition actually. Uh, uh, why life threatening condition and why we do why do we, we we give hydrocortisone because here the patient is liable to something called adrenal crisis what do you mean by adrenal crisis here the level of cortisol in blood will be um, uh, decreased or diminished and the patient may die from this so we give intravenous corticosteroid and prepare this patient for operation for decompression operation actually number b recovery of site is rare uh, even with decompression surgery, no, this is false. The risk of uh, uh, pituitary apoplexy is a known uh, pituitary macroadenoma uh, in 5% uh, per year. Actually, uh, I'm not sure about the percentage, but here, yes, the risk of pituitary adenoma, or the, uh, sorry, uh, the, the risk of uh, pituitary apoplexy is known is a known pituitary macroadenoma. This is true, but the percentage, I'm not sure. Here for number A is absolutely true. Number D, women are more at risk of developing pituitary apoplexy than men. Actually, women are more at risk for developing Sheehan syndrome, not pituitary apoplexy, than men. So the answer here is, um, is A, intravenous hydrocortisone should be given as soon as the diagnosis is made. Number 55, during um, measurement of CSF pressure at lumbar puncture, which one of the following statement is most likely to be true? A CSF of uh, 25 centimeter uh, H2O is equivalent to 18 millimeter mercury. Yes, this is absolutely true. I know this is very tough and this is uh, uh, somehow very confusing. In order to calculate it correctly, um, I'll, uh, uh, if I want to, to um, uh, consider 25 centimeter water, I'll uh, multiply this by 0.7. Uh, this will give me the value, but in millimeter, not centimeter, in millimeter mercury, okay? Millimeter, millimeter mercury will be uh, somehow uh, related to, or somehow near 18 millimeter mercury. Okay, the patient should be sitting up. No, the patient will be sitting or, or uh, lying on his uh, left side, okay? So number B is false. Number C, the upper limit of the normal range of uh, pressure is lower in obese, no, higher in obese and valsalva will increase, not reduce the CSF pressure. So here the, uh, the answer for sure is number A, CSF uh, pressure of 25 centimeter H2O is equivalent to uh, 18 millimeter mercury. 56, which one of the following is uh, the most likely cause of repeated episodes of uh, monoocular uh, vertical oscillopsia in 25 year old women? Uh, this is superior oblique myokemia. For superior oblique myokinia, this is not actually true nystagmus. Why? Because uh, it can occur, it can affect just one eye. Nystagmus will be um, uh, will be movement of both eyes. And also nystagmus has a condition which has the fast phase and the slow phase or the slow and uh, after that the fast and so on. Okay, so this is not a true nystagmus. This is just superior oblique myokinia. And uh, this will result in monoocular vertical oscillopsia. Why, why there is oscillopsia? Because actually it is, it is not uh, permanent. It is just transient or just episodes. 
episodes, it is not permanent one. If it is permanent and if it is congenital, uh, the dancing of the visual field won't be likely, but this is not likely in superior oblique myokemia, which is episodes. So oscillopsia or dancing of the visual field will, will be likely here in this case. So the answer is number D. 57 uh, in a 50 year old uh, with uh, recent onset um, vertical double vision, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Bilateral ptosis excludes a brainstem lesion. No, actually, regarding the brainstem here, we do have the nucleus for the levator is unpaired. Actually, if this nucleus is affected, uh, both sides or the bilateral doses can occur. This appearance yeah, on uh, lying flat indicates fourth cranial nerve palsy. No, this appearance on lying flat indicates acute deviation rather than fourth nerve palsy. Fourth nerve palsy, actually, if the patient is tilting to the other side, the um, uh, vertical diplopia or the vertical double vision uh, will disappear. So number B is false. Number C, hypertropia of the abducted eye indicates askew deviation. Yes, this, this one is not related. Hypertropia of the abducted eye is not uh, even related to uh, fourth nerve palsy. So it will indicate more skew deviation. Positive Pilchowski head tilt to the right indicates a left uh, fourth cranial nerve palsy. This may be true, but this may be true if we consider that um, head tilt to the right without positive Pilchowski, because both positive Pilchowski mean that the diplopia will increase um, when the head is tilted to the right, and this is not true. Okay, so number uh, C is true. Hypertropia of the, uh, the abducted eye indicates askew deviation. Look at this one. Uh, 60 at 22 uh, year old university student has noticed diplopia in the right gaze, just in the right gaze for many years. Look at the primary position. She may have some, some, some sort of left hypertropia, but this is not uh, significant. Actually, actually, in the primary position, she doesn't complain in anything. Uh, when she's looking to the left also, there is nothing to be mentioned. When she's looking to the right, look at this eye. Look at the left eye. The left eye is somehow elevated, somehow elevated left eye. So here she has so, uh, uh, inferior oblique overaction, maybe, or she has some sort of uh, um, uh, superior oblique palsy. So here for, for both of them, number A, a base down prism in uh, front of uh, the left eye. This may alleviate the condition, but actually she's not complaining in the primary position. So, so, so this one won't be the good one. Number B, this insertion of the left inferior oblique muscle. Yes, this one won't affect the primary position. And actually this can result in improvement in her uh, right gazed uh, uh, diplopia, right gazed evoked diplopia. So number B is the good one. Steroid injection around the left trochlea, no trial of, actually this may be in, in cases of, um, in cases of uh, Brown syndrome. So number C is false. Uh, periodostic mean, this will be uh, related to mycenae graves, and this is false. So the answer here is number B, this insertion of the left inferior oblique muscle. Six to one with regard to uh, cataracts in children, which one? A seven-year-old child with lamellar cataract and an acuity of six nine can be expected to achieve better uh, functional reading acuity with cataract surgery, no. Actually, the reading capacity will be decreased. Actually, this patient is having uh, accommodation. And we deprive patient from accommodation after cataract surgery. So this is uh, absolutely false. Number B, anterior polar cataract, more ambiogenic than posterior, no. Uh, posterior is more ambiogenic. Posterior is near uh, uh, or nearer the nodal point, so is more ambiogenic. Also, posterior can result in more distortion of uh, yeah, light and more clear uh, due to more scattering of light. Number C, galactosemia uh, or galactosemic cataract typically disappears if galactose-free diet is started within one week uh, at birth. This is absolutely true. Galactosemia cataract, which is oil droplet cataract, can be reversed uh, if diet uh, control is strict. Number D, surgery for posterior lentiglobus cataract is associated with more post-operative inflammation uh, then for congenital rubella. No, rubella will be more um, associated with inflammation and more associated with complications. Actually, uh, the rubella eye is a small eye. The rubella eye is having uh, also um, a glaucoma. 
and cataract, total cataract actually. Okay, so the answer here for uh, 61 is uh, C. Question 65, which is the leash nodule. Here, the nodule are melanocytic uh, hamartoma. This will be the good one, melanocytic hamartoma. Actually, um, uh, this is associated with neurofibromatosis type 1, NF1, but the lesion itself is, is not neurofibroma. The neurofibroma will be present in the skin, for example, or in the eyelid, but it, not, it is not present in the iris. So the nodules are melanocytic hamartoma, number C. Number 66, regarding preceptal cellulitis in children, which one of the following is most likely the cause? Um, what, what will you pick? Uh, is it uh, Haemophilus influenza or is it Staph aureus? Actually, I'll go more with uh, Staph aureus one uh, because here Haemophilus influenza, uh, here um, um, there is a vaccination or there was a vaccination in the uh, past uh, years for hemophilus influenza type B, it is still uh, a reason for having preceptal or orbital cellulitis in children, or especially in children, but actually here this is uh, uh, decreasing. So number C, Staph aureus or Staphylococcal aureus will be uh, by far the most common cause for having preceptal or even uh, orbital cellulitis. So number uh, C is the true one. Number 67, with regard to perforating keratomalacia in a five-year uh, old child, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Perforating keratomalacia. Single dose of uh, 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 10,000 international units of um, retinol um, acetate is curative? No. Actually, here, single dose is false, and the dose also, which is uh, just 10,000, is uh, extremely false. Uh, Beto spots uh, typically uh, take on... Um, a foamy appearance because of the gas formation by foreign bacteria. Actually, here, uh, gas formation, yes. Uh, foamy appearance, yes. Corrin bacteria, maybe. Uh, because actually, corrin bacteria is, is uh, present as um, a normal flora, can be present as a normal flora. So number B is, isn't false. Number C, giant papilli, uh, is associated, actually. Uh, this is not related uh, to keratomalacia, related to uh, either mechanical uh, rubbing or mechanical uh, uh, cause or um, uh, spring cutter or perineal keratoconjunctivitis. So number C is false. Number D, the stratified squamous epithelium of the conch is transformed into columnar epithelium with excessive goblet. No, this is false. So here the answer is number uh, B, because spots are foamy uh, because of gas um, uh, due to the proliferation of or the, the, the action of um, uh, normal commensals like corin bacteria. 68, an eight uh, year old child has a manifest esotropia, which is controlled when hypermetropic correction of plus 2.5, the upper uh, sphere right and left is worn. The child is keen on stopping uh, or stop wearing glasses. Which one of the following statement is most likely appropriate or the most appropriate is this continuation of glasses no the the, the diptopia will occur and the isotropia will be evident occlusion no actually this is not a solution for diptopia occlusion number c orthoptic exercise maybe or orthoptic exercise or surgery what do you what 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 will you pick actually here the patient is just eight years old so surgery is not indicated because the patient may manifest immetropization so the patient will uh, uh, his, his uh, vision may improve or his refractive error may improve. And this will result in uh, weaning from the glasses. Actually, I can uh, decrease the amount of glass or I can decrease the amount of, um, uh, gradually decrease the amount of uh, the hypermetropia in order to, um, in order to have, um, uh, in order to exercise for, um, uh, the fusional divergence, increase the fusional divergence. And also the orthoptic exercise will be aimed or will be targeting this. In orthoptic exercise, the patient is ESO. So I'll give him base in, I'll give him base with deviation. This is exercising press. So orthoptic exercises may be uh, helpful for, for this patient in order to stop his glasses. And uh, the aim of this is increasing the divergence 
or the fusional divergence capacity from the brain. Okay, so number C is uh, true one or optic exercise is the most appropriate one. Surgery actually may be indicated, but not in this year or not in this age. Uh, the Harada ETO procedure, this is easy one, is uh, aimed to treat uh, excyclotorsion, which is associated with superior oblique palsy. Uh, number 71, uh, which one of the following is the most common genetic cause of visual impairment worldwide in infants and children? Is it BIST or Stargardt? Actually, here Stargardt is the, the, the most common uh, one, okay? And after that, uh, the BIST will uh, be more. Actually, Stargardt is uh, the, the most common heritable uh, macular disease, most common heritable macular disease. After that, it is best, the second most common. Um, for visual impairment, visual impairment can occur in infants or children in Stargardt and also in liver congenital amaurosis. But actually, which is more common? Stargardt by far is more common. Liver is a rare form of uh, you know, retinitis pigmentosa. So the answer here is C, Stargardt syndrome. Uh, 72, which one of the following is uh, the most likely mode of inheritance in Stickler, actually it is autosomal dominant. Stickler and Wagner, both of them are autosomal dominant. Uh, number 73, uh, 48, sorry, 84 uh, year old patient complains of horizontal tiptopia for distance. The press cover test uh, measurement are near, biz out for present doctor. Um, uh, uh, base out for present doctor distance. Uh, this is for for uh, for near for out for um, for sorry uh, for near it is for present doctor, and for distance it is fourteen. And for um, this one, which is primary gaze, it is um, base out twelve, and for left gaze it is base out uh, twelve also. Yeah, which one of the following? Actually, look at this one. Here the patient has uh, uh, ESU, but, e but this ESU is unlikely, um, or this ESU is uh, somehow uh, increasing in far vision. So the patient in far vision is like that. And in near vision, the patient will be like that. So this is uh, some sort of um, age-related distance isotropia. The patient has a problem with Divergence, actually. So this is age-related distance isotropia, or uh, division, the diversion paralysis. Uh, actually, this is not uh, false, but this uh, won't explain that uh, level of um, this won't explain that level of decreased, even decreased um, uh, convergence level here at near. So the patient may have con uh, divergent paralysis or age-related distance isotropia, but for me, I'll pick this one, age-related. Actually, look at this age. It is age-related distance isotropia, which is uh, also a form of, diverg of divergence paralysis, but the answer here is A, more, more evident to be, or more likely to be A. Uh, look at this one, which one uh, of uh, the following cells illustrated in the diagram? Figure 74 uh, below is responsible for the B wave on the ERG. Uh, actually, B wave is generated by the bipolar and uh, also um, the molar cells. Here, number C, which is bipolar cells. Number D is related to the amacrine cells, and actually, the amacrine cells uh, will be associated with uh, some oscillatory waves in the ascending limb of B wave, but here the answer will be frankly C, which is bipolar cells. Number 75, um, a four month old baby presents with sudden uh, onset left corneal edema with this uh, membrane breaks and normal IOP. The right eye examination is normal. Which one of the following is most likely diagnosis? If it is burst trauma, it will be evident uh, from burst actually. Oh, it won't be that sudden after four months. Uh, non accidental injury, this will be associated with more than. Uh, this uh, lesion, just it won't be just a sudden onset corneal edema. Um, 
which is shaken baby syndrome actually. Number C, uh, posterior polymorphous dystrophy. This is uh, asymptomatic actually. Number D, primary congenital glaucoma. This is the one due to splits in the dysmets membrane. This will result in sudden onset or may result may result in uh, may result in sudden onset lift corneal edema or corneal edema in general. And actually, here the dysmets uh, membrane uh, breaks or splits are called hapsistri, which are horizontal H. Uh, for horizontal and H4 hapsis drive. Number 76, which one uh, of the following stages of retinopathy prematurity is demonstrated in this figure? Um, for me, I'll pick stage three because I see something like new vessels here and here. Actually, the photo is not that obvious, but here um, for me, the logic one is number uh, uh, C, which is stage three, because actually I don't see the demarcation line, which can define one or two, and also I don't see any retinal detachment. But uh, the the photo in the exam must be more obvious than this. So um, uh, regarding this photo, I'll go with uh, by by exclusion, or I'll I'll go by um, using my imagination. I'll I'll pick number C. Look at uh, 77, regarding this photo, uh, figure 77, uh, which one of the following is most likely? Here, look at this one. Here, the patient has restrict restriction in abduction or abduction limitation. Here, abduction limitation in this eye. So uh, left gaze will be affected here because there is abduction uh, limitation or limitation in ab abduction, okay? Uh, the primary position is somehow normal. Look at the secondary position, the other position, which is uh, right gaze. Look at this eye. This eye uh, will be, will have some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of uh, inward uh, movement or some so sort of retraction. Uh, this eye will be retracted and uh, overshooting or upshooting like that. This is consistent with the Duane syndrome. Duane syndrome. So the patient is having limited abduction together with retraction in the medial position. This is consistent with Duane syndrome. And also the left eye is more commonly affected in type one Duane syndrome. This is extremely consistent with Duane. So um, the answer is B. 78, regarding DVD, which one? It is always bilateral and symmetrical. No, this is false. Uh, actually it is um, uh, unilateral. It is present when we cover, uh, just we cover, uh, one eye. And if it is bilateral, it, it must be asymmetrical. Um, it may be associated with latent or manifest latent nystagmus. Actually, this is true. And maybe this is uh, the theory or this is the explanation for having manifest latent nystagmus in people or in children with infantile isotropia. So number B is for sure true. Number C, elevating eye in towards an off gaze, or uh, number D, elevation is more obvious in abduction. Actually, D is not false, but here for me, I'll pick B, which is, it is, uh, it may be associated with latent uh, uh, or manifest latent nystagmus because it is written, frankly, in American Academy, it is written that may be associated with latent or manifest latent, and actually it may be the etiology behind this, behind manifest latent in, in children with infantile isotropia. Okay, number 79, regarding patients with large isotropia and myopia, this is um, the procedure uh, for treatment will be Yokoyama procedure. Yokoyama procedure in which we, uh, we join the lateral rectus with the, the superior rectus or superior rectus with the lateral rectus because here in, in high myopia or large isotropia with high myopia, the patient, look at, look at the, the angle here, the angle is very, I'll make it in, in yellow in order to be more obvious. Look at the cornea here. Here, look at the optic, uh, optical axis here. The degree of myopia is very uh, large, okay? You have um, a large angle, large isotropia. Uh, sorry, not, not the degree of myopia, the degree of isotropia. Isotropia will be very high. Okay. Uh, um, uh, in this uh, disease or in this uh, large isotropia or heavy eye syndrome or heavy eye disease, here you do have um, this location or you have oblique orientation of the ver vertical muscles, which are superior rectus and inferior rectus. So here I'll join the superior rectus with the, 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 the lateral rectus, both eyes, and this can uh, correct this 
uh, efficiently. So number A is uh, the true one, uh, Yokoyama procedure. Bilateral medial rectus recession won't be that enough uh, in, in a case like that in heavy eye syndrome. Number 18, uh, regarding pediatric keratoconus, which one? Uh, corneal cross-linking is not effective? No. Less severe at diagnosis compared to other? No, it will be more aggressive actually. Not associated with vernal? No, it is associated with vernal. Uh, number D, progression occurs at a higher speed than in adults? Yes, this will be the true one because I told you that it is more aggressive than, uh, uh, than adult uh, keratoconus. Okay, number 81. Um, um, which one of the following features is most likely to be seen in superior orbital fissure syndrome? Loss of corneal sensation, yes, because of the presence of mesociliary nerve. And also, um, uh, yes, mesociliary nerve alone, mesociliary nerve will be associated with corneal sensation or will be uh, responsible for uh, transferring sensation from the cornea to the trigeminal uh, nucleus. So here number A is true. Meiosis is a function of um, the parasympathetic, uh, okay? Uh, sorry, the, the meiosis was, will be, will be a, a defect in the sympathetic defect. Meiosis of the pupil will be a result of uh, sympathetic paralysis and sympathetic enters the globe not by the superior orbital fissure but through the optic canal together with the ophthalmic artery. Numbness of the cheek, this is infraorbital nerve function and infraorbital nerve will pass through the inferior orbital fissure. Relative apparent pupillary defect. This is optic nerve function. Uh, so uh, it passes through the optic canal, not superior orbital fissure. So the answer here will be number um, uh, A, which is loss of corneal sensation. And we can remember this appearance. And here, this is the exact location of the nasociliary nerve, which it is within the uh, common tendinous ring to the medial side, actually of um, the superior orbital fissure. Okay, number uh, 82, regarding orbital lymphoma, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Diplopia is the most common presenting complaint? No. Extra nodal uh, marginal zone lymphoma, which is uh, IMSL, uh, is uh, uh, the most common subtype? Yes. We do have more than one subtype. We, we do have this one. We do have also um, uh, other ones like um, uh, follicular or mental uh, cell type and so on. So here, uh, this is the most common one, which is B cell lymphoma actually. Uh, the intraconal space is the most common site. Actually, any, any part of the orbit will be uh, or may be affected. Number D, the median uh, duration of symptoms before diagnosis is two months. I think this is a um, prolonged one. Okay, uh, so the answer here, frankly, will be number B, IMSL, is the most common subtype. Actually, according to American Academy, it is something like more than 50% of all lymphomas. Regarding liver spasm, which one of the following is most likely to be true? 20% of patients have underlying neurodegenerative uh, disease. Uh, no, uh, and that's why MRI uh, is not necessary. So A and B, uh, sorry, A and C are, are false. MRI of the head is necessary to roll out a neurological cause. This is false. Look at number D symptoms are most commonly unilateral. No, this is also false. So B by exclusion and also B is true. 90%, actually 95% of patients respond to Botox injection. Yes, uh, because it will result in paralysis of the orbicularis or the muscle of Rulan, which is responsible for this uh, essential blepher spasm. Uh, actually, uh, MRI is uh, necessary if the case is unilateral. If we do have something called hemifacial spasm, because hemifacial spasm, we have to rule out the compressive lesions. In hemifacial spasm, we do uh, MRI. So MRI is necessary for this one because it can be um, significant for compressive tumor on the facial nerve. So number uh, B is the answer. 90% response well to... Um, uh, uh, Botox or botulinum toxin injection. Uh, 84, regarding MRI scans of the orbit, which one is most likely to be true? Acquisition of the scan takes approximately five minutes. No, actually it is um, prolonged. It is not fast like CT. Number B, post-contrast image are obtained with T2 weeding. No, 
this is false. Why it is false here? Because uh, uh, T1 will will have hyper intensity, hyper intensity in what? Hyper intensity in fat and in blood, and also in the stains which are injected like the gadolinium dye. This this will be hyper intense using tin one. So in, if I want to enhance uh, the lesion, I can um, inject gadolinium and use T1 weighted um, MRI. Steer, which is a, a short tau inversion recovery, is a type of fat suppression sequence. Yes, this is absolutely true. Here, uh, this one is, um, uh, and actually, this fat suppression occurs in T. One we did uh, also um, MRI. Water appears brighter than uh, fat on T1. We did uh, imaging. No, fat will be brighter and water will be dark. Actually, look at the eye. The eye will be dark. The vitreous will be dark. Okay, so number D is um, false one. The answer is C. Uh, 85, which one of the following eyelid defects is most appropriate for healing by secondary intention. What will you pick? Actually, here the medial canthus or uh, the anterior lamella, just the anterior lamella five and five also defect uh, of uh, uh, the lower uh, or the medial lower lid. Actually, here, look at this one. Um, for the first one, which is full thickness, lateral eyelid or full thickness defect of the lateral upper lid. Upper or lower, this is false. So number A and B for false thickness is false. Number C and D, they can, actually they can uh, be healed using the secondary intention. For me, I'll pick number C, five and five defect of the medial canthus because this is the most common location for uh, leaving um, um, a defect to heal by secondary intention. Um, for number D, anterior lamella, Actually, this can also heal with, uh, for me, this also can, can heal with um, uh, secondary intention because of what? Because you have here the tarsus, which is intact and it work, it will work as a scaffold for epithelialization or re-epithelialization or regeneration of the skin here over this uh, part. So number D is also true, but here I'll, I'll pick number C because commonly the most common location to leave uh, a defect or a small defect to heal with um, uh, indentation or in, uh, intention, sorry, secondary intention, it will be the medial canvas location. So um, I'll pick this one. These are repeated uh, 83 and 84 and 85. We, we solved them. 86 regarding frontal osmoidal mucosal of the orbit. Any globe displacement is usually downward and temporal? Yes, because the lesion is up. The lesion is up and Medial. So the globe displacement will be in this direction. It will be out and down. So uh, number A is true. Uh, number D definitive treatment can be achieved by drainage through an upper lid skin crease incision. No, actually, excision, not incision. This is um, uh, not uh, an option. Number C erosion uh, through the orbital bones suggests malignant transformation. Uh, no, number D, pain is a rare symptom. No, uh, because it, it is affecting the uh, sinuses. And here, the sinusitis itself will be um, painful. Okay, so number A is the good one. You know, number A is frankly true. So number A is the good one. Number 87, regarding those surgery, which one is most appropriate to describe the white line advancement technique? White line advancement technique is um, uh, uh, um, somehow a shortening of the levator muscle or levator aponeurosis. So it is a strengthening procedure to the levator muscle. The tissue excised in this technique includes a small strip of superior tarsus. No, this white line advancement, which may be actually anterior or posterior, posterior approach, uh, will spare this one, will spare uh, the superior tarsus. Also, it will spare. The molar's muscle also it will spare uh, uh, some part of uh, the conjunctiva or the conjunctiva. So here it is a very good operation or a very, very good option. Number B, the technique can be approached by the skin crease incision or by posterior approach. Yes, this is absolutely true. Number B is uh, true. 
Number C, this technique is effective um, uh, primarily uh, due to shortening of Muller's muscle. No, shortening of the levator, not Muller. This technique is suitable for congenital ptosis with levator function less than three millimeter. No, no I, I must have moderate action or good action for, it is preferable to have good action for the levator muscle. So um, and the answer here, frankly, will be number B. 88 regarding developmental mass lesions, which one of, um, which one of the following classes uh, is most likely to include dermoid cyst? Actually, it is choristoma, which is the presence of normal tissue in, in, uh, in an abnormal place. So number A, choristoma is uh, true. And the, the example for this is uh, the dermoid uh, or the limbal dermoid one, which is associated with, uh, or maybe associated with golden heart syndrome. Number 89. Regarding orbital cellulitis, blood cultures are useful in selecting antimicrobial therapy. Not blood culture, actually, the culture from um, the orbit, okay? So, or um, uh, the uh, swab from the orbit, um, from the inflamed area, but blood culture will indicate, will be, as, will be associated more with uh, uh, bacteremia or septicemia, which is not uh, uh, present in, in uh, cases or in, in most, uh, most of cases of orbital cellulitis. Number B, conjunctival swabs are useful? No. Number C, medial subperiosteal abscesses are more likely to require surgical drainage than lateral um, uh, collections? No, actually the non-medial location will be indication. Subperiosteal abscesses frequently resolve within intravenous antibiotic therapy in younger or in young children. Yes, this will be the answer. Number D will be the good answer for this one. Question number 90, regarding the effect of immunosuppressive drugs on development of periocular skin cancers, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Biologic therapies targeting tumor necrosis factor are associated with decreased risk of uh, periocular skin cancer? No, it will, it will raise the um, uh, likelihood of having periocular skin cancers because here they are tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. Okay, so they inhibit the tumor necrosis factors like adalimumab and infliximab and so on. Number B, calcineurine inhibitors are less strongly linked to tumor development than other classes of immunosuppressive. No, they are the most uh, commonly associated with uh, cancers. Um, they, they, they are bad in this. Okay, number C, skin cancers de uh, developing um, uh, in, in patients uh, on immunosuppressive are more common, but less aggressive than in other patient groups. Skin cancers are more common. Yes, I agree with this, but also more aggressive because there is no immunity at all. Number D, squamous cell carcinoma is the periocular malignancy for which uh, risk is most increased by immunosuppressive drugs. Actually, yes. Uh, for squamous cell carcinoma and also Kaposi sarcoma, but squamous cell carcinoma is more significant, okay? But Kaposi sarcoma is more common uh, in order to be uh, accurate. Uh, Kaposi is more common and squamous cell carcinoma is more significant, okay? So number D is a uh, true answer or true one. Number 91, regarding systemic acyclovir for periocular indications, which one? Acyclovir works by inactivation or inactivating viral thymidine kinase. Actually, no, it is a base analog. It is not targeting any enzymes. So number A is false. Number B, aplastic anemia is the most common serious um, side effects or side effect of rapid intravenous infusion. Actually, here, aplastic anemia is, is not the most common one, okay? Number C, strains of uh, uh, herpes simplex virus may become uh, resistant to acyclovir due to mutation in viral DNA polymerase. I think this will be uh, true because I, I have uh, or, or, or I had many articles uh, talking about the resistance from or the herpes simplex virus resistance to the acyclovir. So uh, I'll pick C. Number D, systemic acyclovir is absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. No, it is relatively, but not absolutely. Uh, uh, contraindicated. So number D is false. Okay. So here B and C, maybe one of them is true. For me, I'll go with C. 
but I'm not sure, I'm not 100% uh, uh, sure of this one. Number 92, regarding keratoacanthoma of the eyelid, which one of the following is most likely to be true? The edges uh, is often ulcerated, no. Uh, number B, the growth phase of the lesion is typically from six to nine months. No, the growth phase will be very rapid. It, 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 will, uh, it will be just weeks, just four weeks or four to six weeks, something like that. Okay, number C, the lesion has a similar appearance to an infiltrative basal cell carcinoma. No, it, no it, it, it has a similar appearance to squamous, not basal, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, untreated lesions have a tendency to undergo spontaneous regression, yes. Uh, but actually, when, when you have a, a lesion of keratoconsoma, because it is very hard to be differentiated from a squamous cell carcinoma, you have to excise it and you have to uh, do histopathological examination. Actually, we treat it as we do have squamous cell carcinoma. It is, uh, uh, we, we can't uh, know for sure that the diagnosis is just keratoacansoma. But if you leave this lesion, and if it is truly keratoacansoma, it will regress. Number 104, regarding suppurative keratitis, candidate the commonest of fungal in tropic climates? No. Uh, Aspergillus, actually. Candida is uh, more in, in immunocomprom immunocompromised uh, persons. Eusarium keratitis response will to anatomycin? Yes, this is absolutely true. Why? Uh, here you, you, you remember the MAT study, which is mycotic um, uh, ulcer uh, treatment trial. Okay. Uh, in this trial, the Fusarium um, uh, keratitis responded well to natamycin, then to voriconazole. Others will have similar effect uh, or similar response uh, to both voriconazole and natamycin. Here, Fusarium is uh, uh, responding very well to natamycin. This is, this is absolutely true. Number C, gentamicin is the treatment of choice. No, hyphae rarely seen on gram stain. No, gram stain can also uh, stain uh, the fungal or the fungal uh, keratitis or fungal infection, fungal specimens. Number uh, 105, regarding trachoma, which one is most likely to be true? Uh, infection is more common in uh, adults than in children. No, children more from the age of um, two years to five years, something like that. Okay, number B, uh, proliferation of goblet cells is noted on histology. No, this is absolutely false. Trachoma affects females more than males. Yes, number C is true, um, which is uh, actually, it is not that significant sex predilection, but it is present. Number D, trachoma causes secretion ectropion, no, secretion entropion, more likely. So number C is the true one. 106, collagen cross-linking with riboflavin activated by ultraviolet uh, treats keratoconus by which mechanism strengthening of the stromal collagen bonds. And this is uh, easy. And also, I think it is repeated from uh, previous clinical or advanced ICO exams. 107, regarding acanthamoeba keratitis, which one um, can be diagnostic test? Uh, it is confocal microscopy. You will find some, some, something like bright, uh, spots or bright areas which are the acanthamoeba cysts. So number A is true. Uh, 108 regarding corneal graft rejection. Which one? In a normal uh, in a normal adult, uh, it mostly occurs about more than two weeks after the graft. Actually, yes, this is not be before two weeks after the graft. So. Uh, more than two weeks, even more than years, okay? But, but actually it is not before then two weeks or before two weeks. Okay, number B, uh, in stromal rejection, there are subepithelial infiltrates, concentric with the limbus, no. It is always symptomatic, no. The risk of rejection is lower in infants, no. So here this uh, one is also repeated and the, the answer is A, in normal adults, it mostly occurs um, uh, more than two weeks after the graft. Question 109. Um, a 32-year-old myopic woman wearing contact lenses uh, developed sore right eye. Sore right eye means that this eye is hypremic, as you see. Red eye. Following uh, uh, an 
uh, intercontinental flight from uh, Australia to Canada. Her eye felt uncomfortable when she removed her contact lenses. She presented two days later with the appearance seen in this figure. Actually, this is uh, contact lens related keratitis with hypopion like that, as we see. This is uh, a case of um, a sterile hypopion, actually. So uh, to perform anterior chamber tip, no. Actually, this is not endophthalmitis. This is not, this is just a sterile one. To perform intravitreal injection, no, it is not endophthalmitis. To perform specular microscopy, also this is false. Number D, to take a scrap for microscopy and cultures. Yes, this is absolutely true. This is the true one. Uh, question 110. Uh, look at this uh, one, it is dendritic ulcer. I think this is repeated. And the answer is topical antiviral agents are indicated uh, at this time. Actually, this is very easy one, uh, very direct one. Okay. Uh, 111 regarding tresia. Uh, cystic spaces are common. No, this is false. Xenophils are more uh, common than basophils. Um, in, in the tresia itself, actually it is fibrous. And these, uh, uh, or, or the specimen will be more eosinophilic than basophilic, but actually um, here we are not talking about this. Uh, number C, inheritance is autosomal dominant. No, it is acquired, it's not inherited. Number D, stromal elastosis is common. Yes, stromal elastosis is common regarding tresia and also regarding pinguicula. But here uh, the answer is D, frankly it is D. Xenophils actually may be more common in, in cases of allergy, allergic reactions, not uh, uh, degenerative ones. So here the answer is D, stromal elastosis is common. Uh, 112, regarding conjunctival melanomas, which one is most likely to be true? Amelanotic melanoma are usually blue in color? No. Caruncular or palpebral uh, sites have a better prognosis? No, this will have the worst one. Common sites for metastasis include the kidneys, Actually, common sites for metastasis is uh, 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 for sure it will be the, the liver. Mortality is 10% at five years. Actually, mortality will be higher than this, uh, something like 19% um, uh, 19% um, at five years. So for me, um, I may pick D by exclusion. Because all of them are false. All other choices, A and B and C, are uh, absolutely false. Amelanotic melanoma uh, usually uh, appears white in color, not blue. And caruncular uh, or medial uh, locations will, will have uh, the worst prognosis. Also, um, the common sites for metastasis won't include the liver. It will be uh, the skin, the, sorry, won't include the kidneys. It will be the liver the skin and the brain and, um, uh, the, uh, and, and the heart, sorry, the, 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 the brain and the bone and um, uh, skin and also uh, liver. So uh, kidneys are not yeah, included. Mortality is 10% at five years. It is uh, actually higher than this, but we can consider it at, at, at the true one. Okay, 113. In this figure, this is a keratoconus. And uh, also I saw this uh, question before. This is repeated from uh, the previous ISO exams or advanced exams. So here, you know, a trial of rigid gas permeable contact lens may be tried in, in, um, for, for the eye, which is actually the left eye here, this eye, this one. Okay, so um, question number 114. Uh, the classic epidemic keratoconjunctivitis, adenoviruses type uh, 8 and 19, this is easy one. Uh, 115, regarding this photo, a 19 year old man who was assaulted with a knife. He sustained a corneal laceration with iris incarceration. Which one of the following is the most appropriate course of action? Uh, apply bandage contact lens uh, to seal the wound. Actually, we do this uh, or we, we can do this, but this is not the, the most appropriate course of action. Uh, this is the most immediate one. The most immediate, uh, the most immediate uh, action here is to, to do a bandage or to do contact lens to seal the wound at first. But after that, we, we will take the patient to the operating room or theater and reposition of the iris and suturing the wound 
this will be the most appropriate one. Number B, leave the, the, the I alone. No, this is absolutely false. And number D, try to gently push. This is also absolutely false. So here I'll, I'll, I'll take the patient to the operating room and reposition of the iris and um, suture the one. This will be the most appropriate course of action. Actually, uh, if, if, I'm uh, if I'm talking about the most appropriate uh, or the, the, the most immediate step, it will be A, but the most appropriate, it will be C. 116 regarding uh, the symptoms of diseases of uh, the lids and external structures of the eye, which one of the following statement is most likely to be true? A patient can accurately localize a small corneal foreign body. Yes, this is absolutely true. If the patient has um, um, uh, ocular surface foreign body or corneal foreign body, if it is large, he can see this easily in the mirror. But if it is very small if, or if, if it is a small, the patient won't accurately localize its location. So number A is true. B dryness reported by the patient is really a symptom of actual dry eye. Um, actually, some patients may, may be confused, but uh, yeah, number A is more accurate. Number C, even small subconjunctival hemorrhage are symptomatic. No, uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage uh, are uh, not symptomatic or asymptomatic. Number D, itching usually indicates bacterial infection or no, itching usually indicates allergic reaction. So number uh, A is the true one. 117 in Jogren syndrome, which one of the following is most likely to be correct? A lacrimal gland biopsy is necessary for diagnosis? No. Females are more frequently affected than males? Yes, this is absolutely true. Uh, Jogren syndrome, the females are more uh, affected. And remember the photo from Kansky, it was a female with parotitis and uh, dry mouth and dry uh, eye. So here, uh, remember this photo and consider this as a sex predilection, okay? Or female sex predilection. Number um, 24. 124, which one of the following agents is most likely to, ha to have a causative role in poxiuveitis? Uh, it is the rubella virus. After that, actually, it is toxoplasma if it is present. So rubella and toxoplasma may be implicated. So 125, a 74-year-old subophagic patient presents with her fifth consecutive episode of unilateral intermediate uveitis, which started two to three months after cataract surgery. Her main symptom is increasing floaters. Each time she reduces her topical steroids, her floaters worsen. Which one of the following is the most appropriate plan? Actually, she may have something called masquerade syndrome, which, which may reflect uh, intraocular tumor, something like intraocular tumor or lymphoma uh, and so on. So here to uh, arrange... Um, uh, actually, maybe also pars planitis, but here look at this um, one, which is the fifth uh, consecutive episode. Actually, we can switch to oral corticosteroid if it is just pars planitis, but arrange for vitrectomy uh, with uh, the sample sent for cytology. This is most appropriate in order to exclude malignancy, maybe some, some sort of masquerade syndrome. So number B, is uh, uh, the correct one or the, the most one or the, um, the most correct one, the best one, okay? Uh, number D is not false uh, to, to try or to switch to oral corticosteroid uh, and aim for slow taper over four to six months if it is just pars planitis, okay? So um, the dangerous disease should be excluded at first. So number B um, is... Uh, um, Number B is uh, true one. And also something which is uh, pars planitis or intermediate uveitis is not that common in this age, which is 74 years old. So here in, in Muscarit syndrome, we do, we, we, we may have um, uh, anterior or intermediate and anterior uveitis in relation to uh, some serious problem like lymphoma and so on. So um, the answer for me is B. It is more logic than D. Uh, B and D may be true, but, but for me, I'll, I'll go with B. 126, regarding the sclera, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Uh, actually, the sclera lacks uh, lymphatic vesicles. Uh, sorry, lymphatic vessels. 
Regarding number A, which is immune uh, privileged site, no. Uh, we are when we are talking about something like that, it will be uh, the conjunctive amor, which is uh, uh, immune center actually. Number B or immune immune uh, it has the, the malt which is um, um, uh, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, which is part of immunity. Number B it is uh, a vascular. Actually, it is a vascular except in certain areas, so it is not strictly a vascular. It is perfused via the ophthalmic artery. This may be true, but actually it is not perfused in, in all or in, in, in most of uh, its circumference. So um, uh, number D, lex lymphatic vessels will be um, the true one. Uh, 127, regarding ocular sarcoidosis, which one? Lymphopenia is uh, a common finding. No, this is false. Raised ACE is due to excess neutrophils. No, excess neutrophils uh, indicates um, acute infection or something like that. And this, this is not occurring in the lung parenchyma. So number uh, B is false. Number C, uh, serum calcium is low. Yes, this is absolutely true. You have abnormal serum calcium and here it is low. You have elevated ACE enzyme and you have um, uh, also uh, elevated uh, lysozymes, but uh, serum calcium will be low. So number C is true. Tuberculin is positive. No, tuberculin must be negative in order to rule out um, the uh, tuberculosis TB. Uh, number uh, 128, regarding transmission and infection with toxoplasma gondii, which one of the following is most likely to be correct? 20% of pre uh, packaged meat contain, uh, contains toxoplasma gondii. Actually, this is uh, absolutely false, <laughs> or we, we hope that it is false, actually. Number B, contaminated reservoirs are the most common cause of, of epidemic toxoplasmosis. Yes, this is absolutely true. Number C, ingestion of um, yeah, raw chicken is a common cause of toxoplasmosis. No, uh, raw meat actually um, regarding something like um, a cheap meat or um, pork or something like that. Number D, vertical transmission, the most common, uh, is most common in second trimester, no, in first trimester. So here the answer, frankly, will be number B, contaminated reservoirs like, like soil, like rats, like um, uh, uh, kittens or cats, like uh, also uh, the definitive host, which is um, um, human beings or, or humans. These are, these are all called contaminated reservoirs. 129, regarding immunity, which one of the following is uh, the most likely to confer passive immunity, which is A, uh, number, number A, cross placental transfer from uh, maternal or from mother or of maternal antibodies. This is um, the classic or the typical example for the passive immunity. Uh, number, um, 130, regarding ocular syphilis, which one? Uh, which one is the most typical posterior pool involvement? The most typical is acute posterior, acute syphilitic posterior placoid choroiditis. The most common is uh, number D, which is syphilitic multifocal choroiditis. So here I'll go with number A, which is most typical, more, which, which may be somehow pathognomonic according to Kansky, the you know, fluorescent angiography of this one, acute syphilitic posterior placoid choroiditis may be pathognomonic for uh, yeah, syphilitic choroiditis. So number D, syphilitic multifocal choroiditis is not that typical or is not typical for um, ocular syphilis, but it is uh, uh, the, the most common actually. So I'll go with number E in this question. 131 in patients, with chronic VKH disease, which one uh, is uh, most likely to prevent the progression of recurrent granulomatous choroidal inflammation? Uh, chronic VKH, uh, biological agents or high dose of systemic corticosteroid and immunosuppressive agents or oral prednisone or topical corticosteroid and diseases. In American Academy, it is mentioned like just oral prednisone is um, um, the one. High doses of systemic corticosteroids with immunosuppressives. Yes, this may be true also, but actually immunosuppressive agents are not indicated, um, are not indicated unless there is resistance or there is um, uh, some, um, uh, some unresponsiveness uh, from 
um, the oral prednisone alone. So oral, uh, just oral prednisone will be, for me, will be uh, the correct answer. After revising this uh, from uh, American Academy and also from Kansky. So number C is uh, the good one. Uh, also, it is present, frankly, in iWiki. Which is also related to American Academy. So number um, 131 is oral prednisone C. Um, 132 regarding the treatment of uh, presumed choroidal tuberculoma. Which one of the following? The lesion can be lasered using a photodisruptive laser. Actually, no. Uh, Yag laser. No. This is absolutely not indicated. The lesion can be managed medically. Yes. The lesion can be medi managed medically. Uh, uh, actually. Uh, even you don't have to use corticosteroid in order to make them disappear. So number B is true. The lesion should be removed surgically, no. Radiotherapy, no. So number B is the good one. Number 133, a 68-year-old man with progressive end-stage follicular lymphoma has bilateral inactive uh, cytomegalovirus retinitis and left optic neuropathy. He comes for routine clinic uh, appointment. His vision has been poor in the left eye for one year. Best corrected visual uh, acuity in the right eye is uh, um, um, 0.12 um, uh, logmar, left eye perception of light. Okay, uh, which one of the following is the most appropriate management? Here the, the patient is um, uh, 68. The patient has bilateral inactive cytomegalovirus. So I won't go for parse planovitrectomy. This is very aggressive. This patient doesn't have uh, that long life expectancy. So number C and D parse planovitrectomy, either with silicon oil. Actually, he doesn't have detachment for this. And um, uh, vitrectomy with barrier laser and silicon oil to prevent um, um, to prevent. Uh, detachment. Actually, also this patient doesn't have any retinal detachment to do this, uh, and this patient also doesn't have uh, active cytomegalovirus. For me, um, um, either A or B. Oral prednisolone. If I pick this, this will make this may make the cytomegalovirus retinitis active. This may activate the cytomegalovirus. So observation will be um, the, the the true one. Observation will be the good one to be. Uh, uh, chosen. Okay, so 134. Uh, this figure uh, illustrates the left eye of a 65-year-old patient who complains of uh, pain and red eye. His vision is uh, 2030. Fundus examination is normal. The cupping of the disc is 0.8, and the slit lamp shows a clear anterior chamber and clear lens. Actually, this is not uh, endophthalmitis. This is blebitis. This is not blib associated endophthalmitis. Here I do see a blip and I do see some whitening in this blip. So infection of the blip or blebitis will be treated by topical and systemic antibiotics. This will be the best course of action. Number A and B and uh, C, they are related to uh, endophthalmitis, more related to endophthalmitis. So number D will be the good one. Uh, why uh, uh, don't I uh, choose endophthalmitis because I do have clear anterior chamber, clear lens, actually, and fundus examination, fundus can be seen in, in uh, endophthalmitis. These are very unlikely. Uh, number uh, 35, a healthy 36-year-old um, man presents with loss of central vision and metamorphopsia in his right eye, associated uh, with serous detachment of the macula and multiple peripheral atrophic chorioretinal scars shown in this figure. Actually, we don't see any scars here because just we, we, um, we have very bad photo, a very bad uh, photograph of, of this one. Okay. Uh, here, from this scenario, I'll go with both presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome. Age related macular degeneration is uh, very unlikely to occur in this age, actually. So um, yeah, it is not age-related macular degeneration. Number B, multifocal choroiditis with uveitis. It will be associated with panuveitis. It is called multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis. So uh, here, uh, we don't have any anterior, anterior activity. Um, uh, also, uh, novitritis. 
okay? Uh, presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome will be associated with metamorphopsia, yes, due to the, the, the progression to C in V, okay? And also serous retinal attachment is, is uh, associated also with C in V, which is linked to presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome. Okay, and also the peripheral atrophic or retinal scars is uh, uh, present uh, uh, and has uh, some characteristic appearance in uh, presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome. Frankly, it is not uh, toxoplasma because in, in toxoplasma, uh, here you won't have metamorphopsia in this patient and also serous detachment is not common with metamorphopsia. Okay, uh, so, um, sorry, uh, um, uh, I mean, serious detachment is not associated with toxoplasma, not metamorphosis. Okay, so number uh, number B is a good one, which is sorry, number C, presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome. Sorry for this. Number C, uh, glaucoma question. Which one of the following is uh, the most common mode of inheritance? Primary congenital glaucoma. It is autosomal recessive. Actually, it is most commonly sporadic, ninety percent, about ninety percent. But after that, it is autosomal dominant in just ten percent of cases. Uh, One hundred forty-two. In the ocular hypertension treatment study examined the risk for developing primary open angle glaucoma. This is easy one. And the answer is medical therapy reduced IOP by approximately 20% and was associated with a reduction in risk of developing primary open angle glaucoma from 10 to approximately 10 to 5. Actually, 9.5 to 4.4. But actually, this is the, the, the true one. For sure, this is the true one. The other values are present here in choice number D, but here the reduction in the intraocular pressure was 42%, and this wasn't present in the study at all. So number A is the good one. Number A is the true one. Okay, so um, 143, a patient presents with a shallow AC and IOP of four millimeter mercury uh, on day one, post trabeculectomy which one of the following statement is most likely to be true a trial of topical atropine is helpful as equus misdirection is likely no actually here the patient uh, doesn't have high iop he do he, he does have uh, low iop 4 millimeter mercury the anterior chamber will be shallow yes with equus misdirection but actually with high iop not low b macular oct is helpful in deciding the best treatment I may go with this. Yeah, macular OCT is helpful in deciding the best treatment because um, um, if the patient doesn't have maculopathy, uh, I may give a chance for this patient because the post-operative hypotony will improve or may improve spontaneously, especially if there is no leakage, if there is uh, uh, nothing uh, related to the um, uh, complications or post-operative complications, uh, which, which are reversible one. Okay, so macular OCT is helpful in deciding the best treatment. This may be true. And this will be the true one by exclusion. Orbital floor steroid is preferable to topical in this situation, no. Uh, D, the patient is most likely to be a hypermetrop, no. Actually, the hypotony, hypotony is more related to um, uh, myopic, young myopic patients after trabeculectomy than in hypermetrops. Uh, regarding this one, 146, um, a 55 year old man is referred with IOP of uh, uh, 30 millimeter mercury in both eyes. The angles are open and optic discs are normal. There is no visual field defect. Which one of the following uh, baseline factors is most likely to increase uh, his risk of developing primary open angle glaucoma? Uh, age less than 60 years old, no. Uh, the age must be um, old, okay. Uh, the old age is um, uh, the risk factor. Actually, let's remember the risk factors here which are collected in this mafrud, okay. M for myopia and A for age, which is uh, old age. And F for family history, R for race, which is African race. O for ocular hypertension and D for diabetes mellitus. Actually, uh, myopia is not uh, uh, proved by all the studies, but most of the studies prove that or correlates myopia uh, with, or significant myopia with um, um, 
uh, development of primary open angle glaucoma. So number A and B are called actually uh, cornea thickness, which is less than five 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 microns. Actually, no, uh, it must be less than this. Less than uh, these values. Actually, um, uh, this means that the, if the patient has um, like five forty uh, micron micrometers, this will be at risk. No, this is false. So number B, this value must be less must be uh, less than this value in order to make this uh, correct one. Um, number C, greater mean deviation of home free visual field. This may, may be due to cataract, for example. So this may be not re related. And actually it is not mentioned as having or as being a risk factor. Myopia greater than minus three diopters. Yes, this will be the correct one because here it is significant myopia. And actually all the studies um, uh, didn't uh, uh, didn't mention that it must be high myopia. So number D is the true one. Uh, 147 hypermetropic patient with previous peripheral laser iridotomies undergoes lens extraction. Two days after uncomplicated surgery, the patient uh, presents with uh, an intraocular pressure of uh, uh, 45 millimeter mercury and a shallow anterior chamber. Which one of the following? Treatment here, it, it is atropine for aqueous misdirection. It is actually aqueous misdirection and uh, atropine in order to uh, drag or in order to make the ciliary body. Actually, this is uh, the iris and the ciliary body. The ciliary body is rotated anteriorly. I want to make drag it posterior like that using the cycloplegic or the atropine. So the answer here will be A, atropine for treatment of uh, this one, treatment of um, Equus misdirection <clears throat> or malignant glaucoma. 148 regarding laser peripheral iridotomy, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Uh, laser peripheral iridoplasty is contraindicated after iridotomy in the management of acute angle closure. Actually, it may have um, 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 laser peripheral iridotomy contraindicated after. No, we, we do we do uh, we do laser iridoplasty if there is uh, failed uh, iridotomy uh, due to the presence, for example, of um, uh, plateau iris configuration. So number A is false. Number B, laser peripheral iridotomy has been replaced by lens surgery, like uh, clear cataract extraction or clear lens sorry clear lens extraction as the first line treatment for all primary angle closure. Uh, patients presenting no laser peripheral iridotomy is still uh, uh, the the first uh, action or or the first line treatment. Number C, uh, laser peripheral iridotomy is contraindicated in pigment dispersion. No, it may have a favorable outcome. It may decrease the concavity of um, uh, the iris. So number C is false. Number D, the incidence of new onset this. Uh, photopsia is low after superior, after both superior and temporally placed laser peripheral iridotomies. Actually, this is absolutely true. They are low for, for both of them, for superior and for temporal, temporally placed. And uh, for temporally placed, the, uh, this photopsia will be less, unlike usual or unlike expected, it will be less. Okay. Uh, both of them will disappear within two weeks, actually. So um, uh, the, the patient can adapt them easily. So number uh, D is the true one. 149, which one of the following is uh, most likely cause of um, a, a severe adverse long-term uh, outcome following the use of glaucoma drainage device? It is corneal decompensation. It is the long-term one, uh, severe adverse long-term uh, outcome. It is corneal decompensation. I, I saw this question before. I think that it, it was repeated from uh, the ICO clinicals. Um, a middle-aged man presents with elevated IOP in one eye. On gonioscopy, a widened ciliary body band is identified. So here it is uh, iris recession, or sorry, uh, angle recession glaucoma, or angle recession, not just or, or not, not necessarily associated with glaucoma. So here um, it is iris sphincter tears. This will be more consistent with traumatic uh, angle recession. So number B is the good one, is the answer. Which one of the following situations 
is the intraocular lens most likely to be contributing to the rise in intraocular pressure. A sulcus IOL with you know, optic capture uh, in the bag, um, a sulcus uh, intraocular lens with optic capture in the bag. Actually, here we, we do sulcus um, uh, intraocular lens in cases of, uh, in, in just cases of um, in, uh, non intact uh, bag or non intact posterior or ruptured posterior capsule. So this is not the scenario. If the, uh, if the um, uh, posterior capsule is intact, this may be true, but actually we don't have to do sulcus IOL with um, intact, uh, with intact bag or with intact posterior capsule. Number B, a patient with an iris claw lens and uh, a patent peripheral iridotomy. No, uh, because of patent peripheral iridotomy. So this may, uh, this may be protective against rising intraocular pressure. Patient with peak IOP of 32 millimeter mercury and space conioscopy finding of open angle. No, uh, this is open angle glaucoma patient. Actually, the, the intraocular pressure after the operation will be lowered by about five millimeter mercury after removing the lens, because here we, we, we somehow, uh, we, we were doing somehow the bulking of um, the human uh, group. So number C is false. Number D, a, a phicic uh, patient. Um, this means that the patient is phicic A, means uh, like um, a patient, uh, it is a, a phicic patient or phicic patient with high myopia, high, Arshid palate and uh, tall stitcher. This is Marfan syndrome. Yes, this may be related to rising the intraocular pressure due to um, vitreous prolapse into the anterior chamber uh, to block the pupil or to block the trabecular meshwork. So this may be uh, the one uh, due to um, due to vitreous prolapse into the anterior chamber. Okay. So number uh, hundred fifty four regarding post traumatic glaucoma, which one? is most likely to be true. Why the ancillary body band on gonioscopy is not compatible with a normal eye pressure reading? No, actually this is not uh, true. Because of what? Because why the ancillary body band may be associated with angular recession, but it, it, this is not necessarily uh, present from day one, okay? So angular recession is associated with glaucoma in less than 10% of cases. Not sure about this. And an eye with complete angular recession, the IOP, rise uh, risk period is uh, just one year or I read the dialysis, but a stable lens is protective against raised uh, pressure sequelae. Uh, number D is false. So the answer is either number B or C. Which one we can pick? I'll go with B, which is angry recession is associated with glaucoma less than 10%. Actually within eight years, this is written frankly, Kensky. Within uh, uh, eight years, it will be about um, uh, about uh, eight or 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 nine percent, something like that, or even six percent. So it is less than, frankly, less than ten percent of cases. So the answer is B. Um, One hundred fifty-five. Uh, an uncomplicated trap was performed on a patient with open angle glaucoma using two releasable and one fixed suture. At one uh, at one week uh, postoperatively, um, the um, patient presented with a deep anterior chamber and uh, IOP of twenty eight millimeter mercury. Target IOP is uh, twelve millimeter mercury or less. Which one of the, the following is most likely to control the IOP in this condition? For me, actually, I'll remove one re releasable. Um, uh, suture and start equus suppression uh, drop. Um, actually, this uh, this is uh, just to to uh, prevent uh, the case from sudden hypotony. Um, if I remove the two releasable sutures, so I can move re the two releasable sutures, and this can uh, can make me uh, ca can make me uh, uh, reach my target. But actually, this uh, uh, will result in sudden hypotony from uh, eighty. 88 to just 12. This uh, decrease or this significant decrease 
uh, will be associated uh, with may be associated with some complications, and even this this may be uh, uh, this may make the the intraocular pressure less than twelve, less than the target. So here I'll I'll pick I'll check this one. I'll remove one Elizabeth suture and start equosuppressant uh, drops. Um, blip massage on the slit lamp, no, or inject subconjunctival mitomycin C2 the blip. Actually, we, we just remove one suture and uh, do, and uh, prescribe equosuppressants. Uh, question number 156. Regarding the vascular glaucoma, which one of the following statement is most likely to be true? Uh, this one was repeated again from previous uh, ISO clinical, and the answer was B. It is seen in 40% of the ischemic form. Actually, it is from 40 to 60, the average of 50% of the ischemic form. This is absolutely true. Number um, 157, regarding a patient with secondary glaucoma who needs a corneal graft, which one of the following is most important for the post-operative pressure control? Um, the most the, the most appropriate one or the, the the only one that can be valid it, it will be surgical iridectomy. This myth stripping endothelial keratoplasty will carry also a risk for having uh, post-operative um, intraocular pressure increase. So number B surgical iridectomy uh, will be the one. Large penetrating uh, keratoplasty no. Uh, a thin anterior lamellar uh, graft to achieve the best visual result. No, actually here the uh, anterior lamellar graft or um, the dulk uh, will have or will achieve, won't achieve the best visual uh, result. It is inferior in visual acuity or in visual result or in best correct visual result, uh, inferior than uh, penetrating keratoplasty. So if the answer will be B, a surgical iridectomy. 158. A 35-year-old man presents with IOP of uh, 42 millimeter mercury. He has uveitis and macular uveitis with macular edema. Trabecular meshwork is heavily pigmented, and the angle is open. This is a, a pigment dispersion glaucoma. Which one of the following is um, uh, most appropriate first-line treatment? It will be topical. Uh, glaucoma therapy in order to decrease the intraocular pressure. We can consider peripheral iridotomies, but here number C, which is topical uh, glaucoma therapy, will be uh, the best one or the first line treatment. Okay, question number 159. Before this, I want to comment on um, uh, 158. Regarding peripheral iridotomies, it won't reduce the risk for developing glaucoma, actually. But it, it uh, may in, uh, decrease the risk of having spikes in the intraocular pressure. But here, um, the uh, first-line treatment is topical glaucoma therapy, medical treatment. Uh, maybe uh, 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 laser trabeculoplasty considered, but here, um, number uh, C, which is topical or medical glaucoma therapy, is the first line treatment. Number uh, 59, 159, uh, regarding a recent blunt ocular trauma, which one of the following is uh, sign is most likely to predict a, po a poor visual prognosis. Uh, regarding the penetrating, maybe poor visual acuity at presentation, but regarding the blunt here, for me, I, I see that relative apparent pupillary defect is uh, um, uh, the most uh, important one. Um, uh, poor visual acuity at presentation may be due to corneal edema or, or high fema, uh, actually. High fema uh, won't necessarily uh, be associated with poor visual prognosis. It, it is uh, visual disabling, yes, visually disabling, but actually it can resolve and the patient can restore his vision. So 159 for me, I'll pick a relative apparent pupillary defect. I know that um, uh, uh, some paper is writing something else, and so you are free. Actually, I'm not sitting for this exam. So uh, if you want to make it uh, C, uh, it is OK. If you want to make it D for me, um, if, I'm, um, uh, if I see a clinical case like that, um, if the case has relative apparent pupillary defect, I'll tell the patient that the prognosis uh, is poor. But after blunt trauma and uh, intact globe, uh, actually with, without 
uh, in a ruptured loop, I'll tell the patient something which is, um, um, if, if the visual acuity is poor, I can promise the patient that the, um, uh, 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 actually according to the damage, but I, I, I still uh, may tell the patient that the improvement of um, vision is likely or more likely than uh, having relative apparent clarity. This is my opinion in this one. Okay, 160 regarding corticosteroid induced raised intraocular pressure, which one of the following risk factors is most relevant? Blue iris or connective tissue disorder or myopia or older age, I'll go with B, connective tissue disorder. Actually, myopia is also related to uh, the risk factors, but high myopia, not just myopia. So number B, connective tissue disorder is is uh, frankly associated with steroid induced, uh, with increased risk of uh, steroid responders or steroid induced raised IOP. Uh, 161, iris new vessels is most likely to develop after which one of the following procedures? Uh, uh, actually intracapsular cataract extraction, and this one was repeated from questions because it will res result in uh, some relative ischemia or more ischemia than um, the others. 162, which one of the following is the most accurate uh, description of phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis? It is just lens-induced uveitis. Uh, 163, cataract surgery performed on a patient with pseudo-exfoliation of the lens capsule is associated with an increased Incidence of which one of the following um, patient with pseudo exfoliation uh, with uh, vitreous loss actually because of uh, spontaneous subluxation or dislocation either during the surgery or uh, even after. Okay, so number 164 a pseudo fake patient should receive which one of the following uh, additions for uh, 35 centimeter or 14 inches of reading uh, distance. Actually, it is 2.75. This is an optics one, this is easy. From 2.75 to three doctors actually. So um, uh, to read at uh, this distance, which is 35 centimeters. Uh, we can calculate it simply by doing what? By doing one over uh, 0.35, but approximately it will be 2.75. Um, 165, a patient with diabetes has a visual acuity of 660 or less following cataract surgery, which one of the following pre-existing conditions is most likely to be uh, present? Uh, actually, macular edema. Um, if you have even worse visual acuity after cataract surgery, this uh, uh, may indicate that this patient had macular edema before uh, the cataract. So, here, macular edema is most likely, especially in diabetic patients or in diabetes patients. 166, two days after fecal emulsification of a hypermature cataract anterior vitrectomy and anterior chamber lens implantation, a patient develops elevated IOP, which one of the following is the most likely cause? Equus misdirection will be associated with, with shallow AC, and this is not present here. Inflammation. This is the most likely cause. Iris atrophy is false. Retained viscoelastic maybe, but actually retained vis viscoelastic will, yeah, will, will have elevation from day one. Okay, so two days after FECO, um, uh, and uh, actually vitrectomy again, here um, I'll go with inflammation, intraocular inflammation, which is uh, uh, most likely here. 167 healthy patient, who had cataract surgery with an intraocular um, lens implant two years previously um, has had a recent or recent decrease in visual acuity. Which one of the following is most likely the cause? Here, uh, cataract surgery with IOL implant. Two years previously, actually, is it uh, uh, macular edema or myopic shift or RD or toxic? Lens syndrome. Actually, it is not toxic lens syndrome, which, which is this uh, toxic anterior segment syndrome. This is false. Number C, uh, retinal detachment. No, it is uh, um, uh, actually, I, 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 um, uh, we don't have any clue for retinal detachment here in this question. Myopic shift is false, and macular edema is the true one. 
which is Irving Guess. But Irving Guess may occur earlier than, than two years, actually. Two years is a very prolonged period, but here by exclusion, this will be the correct one. Uh, 168, regarding uh, suspected acute post-operative bacterial endophthalmitis following cataract surgery with IOL implantation, which one of the following is the most appropriate management? Um, injection of intravitreal steroid to reduce toxic inflammation? No, actually this is absolutely false. If it is in the, the first day, we can give topical corticosteroid and we, we, we are suspecting that the patient may have endophthalmitis, so we can give bolus dose of corticosteroid, but topically not, in, uh, not injected intravitreally. Actually, this is, this is false. Obtaining a vitra specimen for culture, yes. And at the same setting, we can inject uh, empirical um, antibiotics, but obtaining vitra specimen for culture, yes. Number C, starting oral antibiotics and monitoring. Oral antibiotics actually is not the um, line of treatment. Um, and uh, actually, you don't have to wait if you are suspecting uh, bacterial endophthalmitis. Removing the IOLs, actually, this is false. Removing the IOLs, this is false. Number uh, 169, during cataract surgery, the intraocular uh, lens, um, uh, which was calculated to produce emetropia in, uh, is uh, contaminated. The IOL had uh, an A constant of 116.8 and a power of 20. The available alternative lenses have A constant of 117.8. So here we are increasing the A constant. So we, we have to increase also the power because so the A constant increased by just one diopter. So the power will be increased with just one diopter. So the answer will be 21. 21. So the answer is D. 170 eight weeks after undergoing superior incision, uncomplicated extracapsular cataract extraction and IOL implantation, a patient has a poor diopter of, uh, against the rule astigmatism, conjunctive lip and gapping of the surgical incision. Actually, this is um, a defect in suturing. So I resuture uh, uh, the cataract. Cryo to the blip, no. Actually, this, uh, um, this is not a blip for Glaucoma, actually, this is a leaky wound, something, something like leaky wound. Um, uh, paired transverse incisions, no. PRK with excimer laser, no, also. So re resuturing of the cataract incision, this will be the good one. 171, regarding uh, sutural cataract, vision is really affected, and this one was repeated from previous exam. 172, development of lens opacities is related to cumulative exposure to ultraviolet B, um, ultraviolet B light in which one of the following areas is this uh, most likely. This one was repeated and according to the answer sheet, it was cortical and uh, posterior subcapsular. And actually, um, uh, for me, I know, uh, what I know is um, that the sun exposure will result in nuclear cataract. But according to the answer sheet of, I think, exam of uh, 2019, uh, you can verify this. Uh, if it is wrong, just tell me, but actually, I, uh, I remember that it was answered like that in this exam, 2019. So number B, cortical and posterior subcapsular. 173, regarding posterior lenticonus, it causes irregular astigmatism. Yes, this one is um, the true one, and also it was repeated. 177, regarding the avoidance of surgical complications in small incision cataract surgery, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Avoiding cauterization of the sclera before tunnel construction reduces post-operative hyphema. Uh, uh, actually, no. Okay, number B, making small uh, or smaller continuous uh, curvilinear capsular excess increases the risk of posterior capsular rupture. Yes, this is true. Here we are not talking about fecal modification. We are not talking about uh, cataract extraction surgery. So we are delivering the nucleus. How can we deliver the nucleus with this small continuous curvilinear capsular excess? So the, the, this, this operation may be uh, more likely to have a posterior capsular rupture. Number C, the scleral tunnel should be at one quarter the thickness of the sclera. No, one half, not one quarter, or even two thirds. 
the thin uh, scleral flaps may result in buttonhole. Number D, when a nucleus is brown, it requires a smaller width scleral tunnel, no wider. So the answer here is B. 178 regarding biometry for predicting the refractive power of an intraocular lens before cataract surgery, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Number A, errors in measurement of uh, uh, the depth of anterior chamber causes a smaller percentage of undesirable post-operative refractive results than errors uh, in measurement of the excellence. Yes, this is absolutely true because in some uh, studies or in some uh, calculations, uh, we don't consider uh, taking uh, the anterior chamber dips like in, um, uh, in, in SRK2, for example, or in, in SRK. So here, errors in measurement of the depth of anterior chamber causes a smaller percentage of undesirable post-operative refractive errors than errors in excellence, which is very significant. Uh, every millimeter is responsible for about three uh, diopters. So number A is true. Number B, standard keratometry techniques in eyes that have undergone previous LASIK surgery for myopia may lead to myopic refractive surprise, no hyperopic surprise. That's why we, we can add, if we don't have the formula, if we don't have the formula in, in our uh, uh, device or our uh, um, uh, biometry, we can just add roughly 4 to 4.5 or even 5 diopters to um, uh, the result. Number C, the difference between XL lens recorded by ultrasound versus optical biometry doesn't correlate with the density of the lens opacities. No, number C is false because actually uh, uh, ultrasound is dependent on velocity and velocity will be affected by the medium, which is uh, density here. So the difference in XL lens is, is uh, um, or may be significant because of this. Okay, number D is also false. So here the answer uh, of this one is uh, E, the first one. 183, regarding the diagnosis of recurrent toxoplasmic retinitis, which one of the following is most likely to be true? Uh, number uh, A, fluorescein angiography shows early hyperfluorescence, no. Number B, uh, PCR is frequently required, no. Serology plays an important role, yes. Serology plays an important role to differentiate between either it is newly acquired or it is old uh, infection, especially in pregnancy. So number C is true. Number D, the clinical picture is general diagnostic. Actually, this is not false also, but uh, for me, I'll go more with um, this one. I'll go more with uh, C, which is uh, persistent hyperplastic, sorry, uh, which is uh, uh, serology plays an important role. Um, uh, regarding the clinical picture, if the patient is immunocompromised, you may find nothing actually or you, you won't find the classic appearance. Uh, you won't find the vitritis, you won't find the headlight uh, in the fog appearance and so on. So here number um, C, uh, serology plays an important role. This is frankly true. Uh, number 184, which one of the following is most likely to cause a drag disc? This is fever, familial exudative vitro retinopathy. Number 185, um, a patient presents with uh, peripheral vascular lesion with larger uh, feeder vessels and associated with exudation, which one of the following uh, statement is true? Actually, this is uh, uh, capillary hemangioma, peripheral vascular lesion, capillary hemangioma with larger or with large feeder vessels. This is uh, capillary hemangioma, yeah, and this is associated with von Hippel and Doe. Autosomal recessive, no. Uh, mutation in gene, uh, or in chromosome 11, no, actually chromosome three. Mental retardation is a common feature, no. Number D, the patient is at risk of developing renal cell carcinoma, yes. And actually the renal cell carcinoma uh, risk is uh, uh, more than or greater than the risk of few chromocytoma. So number D is uh, true. Uh, 160, uh, 186. Um, uh, 50-year-old obese patient is found to have the lesion shown this figure. This may be astrocytic hematoma, but, but, but actually I don't see anything. We, we just, uh, just guessing about this one, macroaneurysm or diabetes or um, something like uh, 
astrocytic hamartoma, but we, we are guessing because the, the photo is very poor. Okay, so um, I'm not sure about this one. Uh, resolution is spontaneous in majority of cases. No, it will be st stabilized in if it is astrocytic hamartoma. Associated retinal hemorrhage is present in 10%, maybe. But actually, I, I don't know because we, we, we don't know for sure the definitive um, diagnosis of uh, this one. Question number 197 regarding uh, vitro retinal lymphoma. CNS is not common? No, this is false. A excellent prognosis, even if detected late? No. Um, uh, malignant T cell, non hodgkin No, it is B cell. Multifocal dome shaped yellow or yellowish subretinal deposits are a feature, and this is the cause of leopard, uh, leopard uh, skin appearance. So, number D is the true one. 198, the image in this figure from a 50-year-old woman who presented with history of blurred vision, photopsia, and ectalopia, and difficulty distinguishing colors, which one of the following statements is most likely to be true? Anterior reviitis, actually, I, I don't see anything regarding this group. I see just pop disc or just uh, stain disc like that, but I'm not sure about uh, anything regarding this one. From the history, I'll go with um, um, a bird shot, which is associated with HLA-829, but I don't know. ICG reveals early hyperfluorescent spots. I don't know. Choroidal thickening is a characteristic. Uh, this may be associated with choroiditis or choroidal, choroidal uh, edema or choroidal effusion. Not choroidal effusion. Choroidal thickening is characteristic, I think. Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know the diagnosis because the photo is very poor. So here, for me, from the history and from uh, the uh, uh, from the history and from the manifestations here, I'll go with bird shot, which is number D. But I'm not sure. 199 uh, regarding diabetic maculopathy, which one? Anti VEGF uh, have shown no benefit on the treatment. In the treatment, no, this is false. Focal laser uh, was of no benefit. Uh, regarding or according to ETDRS, no, this is also false. Reduced blood pressure in diabetes doesn't uh, influence the progression of diabetic macular edema. This is uh, also false because reducing the blood pressure will decrease the uh, the progression of um, uh, diabetic retinopathy and so on. It will decrease the progression of diabetic maculopathy, so our diabetic macular edema. Number D. Actually, there is no study specific for diabetic macular edema and hypertension, but this is by uh, this is logic actually. Number D, uh, reversal of um, vasopermeability and edema following PRP is associated with retinal vasoconstriction. This may be by exclusion actually. Okay, so uh, number uh, two hundred regarding retinal vasculitis, which one of the following statement? is most likely to be or to, to, to be the best diagnostic procedure uh, regarding retinal vasculitis. Actually, it is fluorescein angiography. So uh, the answer is B. Uh, right now, we have finished this stuff exam, actually this exam stuff. Um, uh, and uh, I hope this is helpful for you. Uh, I'll um, upload this on Telegram. And thank you all.